I'm from Chicago, and around here, we like to say, there are two seasons, winter and road construction. Every spring, orange cones appear along the highways, the lanes narrow, and big yellow machines set to work. They grind up the asphalt and batter down the curbs, and lay down endless loads of gravel and concrete. When the work's done, the highway's a thing of beauty, for a few months. Then a new crop of cracks and bumps and potholes sprouts, and the cycle begins again. Although most of America's interstate highways are only 50 or 60 years old, virtually all of them have been rebuilt at least once, and some, like those around Chicago, have to be almost constantly patched and resurfaced. When you compare the Roman roads, whose huge paving stones and elegant bridges seem untouched by the millennia, it's hard not to think that our modern methods are lacking. American expressways and Roman roads, of course, were built with fundamentally different materials and for fundamentally different purposes. But, if nothing else, comparing them has the effect of accentuating the scale and achievements of the Roman road network. By the second century, there were well over 50,000 miles, that is, 80,000 kilometers, of Roman roads radiating out from the golden milestone in the Forum to every corner of the empire. Conduits of trade, instruments of rule, monuments to the imperial order, they ran in uncompromising lines through every terrain. Roman roads skirted the burning edge of the Sahara, where sand drifted among the milestones. They ran through the marshes of northern Europe, suspended on wooden pilings over seas of mud. They cut through the heart of the Alps, grooved and banked to keep wagons from hurling over icy cliffs. Perhaps the best sense of the network's scale comes from the so-called Poitinger Map, a medieval copy of a late Roman atlas. Though distorted to fit a narrow scroll, the map is remarkably detailed, featuring regions, peoples, and no fewer than 2,700 places, all connected by the straight red lines of the Roman roads. The distances between towns are carefully marked, as are way stations along the highways. The Roman roads were equally impressive on the ground. Designed by legionary surveyors and engineers, and often built by detachments of troops, they were marvels of practical engineering. The most familiar method of constructing them, used for the great highways of central Italy, began with digging the roadbed down to a firm layer of subsoil. The trench was then filled with compacted layers of rubble and gravel, and capped with a pavement of local stone, cambered to shed water, and wedged in place with curb blocks. There was always, however, a great deal of regional variation. Outside cities, roads were often surfaced with gravel or packed dirt instead of paving stones. In deserts, they might be little more than a simple track cleared of rocks. In swamps, they were supported with an intricate underpinning of beams and pilings. On the approaches to large cities and in hazardous mountain passes, ruts were sometimes carved into the pavement to both control traffic and prevent accidents. The highways of Italy were paved to a width of 14 Roman feet, that is, a bit more than 4 meters, and often flanked by gravel paths for riders and pedestrians. Tall milestones stood along the shoulder, inscribed with the name and titles of the reigning emperor, and the distance to the nearest town or landmark. Every few miles, a clump of trees might mark an inn or country shrine. And when tombs began to appear by the roadside, a city was never far away. The Roman road network was designed, first and foremost, for military use. Soldiers built the roads, guarded their strategic points, and used them constantly. In fact, the whole design of the roads, with their undeviating lines and long straight slopes, was shaped by the single aim of allowing infantry to march as quickly as possible from point to point. The roads were used, however, by all kinds of traffic. We might imagine a farmer and his mule bringing a load of vegetables to market, a woman walking to visit her mother in the next village, a wealthy man in a litter being carried to a fashionable healing sanctuary, a shepherd herding his flocks by the roadside, and occasionally, galloping along the bridle paths, a rider of the imperial post, the Roman Empire's swiftest and most secure way of sending messages. That brings us to this video's sponsor, Startmail. Most Roman messages were protected only by a wax seal. Today, with so much of our personal and financial information online, 
and so many ways for that information to escape our control, there are more sophisticated ways of securing messages. One of these is Startmail, an email service designed to protect your privacy. As a YouTube creator with a growing channel, I receive quite a few emails. Some, like questions and suggestions from viewers, are welcome. Spam is not. That's why I use Startmail to avoid unwanted messages and protect my information. I especially like two of Startmail's features, the use of aliases to protect my email account from spam and phishing attacks, and the ease of encrypting emails that contain sensitive information. So, if you want to keep your emails private, go to startmail.com slash toldenstone for a 50% off your first year of Startmail. Back on the road. Many aspects of the Roman highways seem modern. They had waysides, they had highway police, they had tolls, and they were characterized by feats of civil engineering that would not be excelled until the 19th century. Take, for example, the Roman road to the St. Bernard Passes of the Alps, which sprang over mountain chasms, drove through boulder-strewn slopes, and culminated in a spectacular rock cut over 220 meters long. The Roman roads were served by thousands of bridges. Hundreds of these have survived to the present day, and a remarkable number still carry traffic. One of the most impressive, pictured in this video, kindly sent to me by YouTuber Unordinary World, is located in Merida, Spain, the Roman Emerita Augusta. At 790 meters, this is the longest extant Roman bridge. It was used by traffic until 1991. Other bridges were even more impressive. The Bridge of Augustus at Narni, for example, was 33 meters high and featured a central arch 32 meters wide. It seems to have stood more or less intact until the Middle Ages, when it was partly leveled by earthquakes. The Romans also carved road tunnels through dangerous mountain terrain. Perhaps the most famous example is in the Forlo Pass, where a tunnel 40 meters long and wide enough for two lanes of wagon traffic carried the Via Flaminia through a high ridge. The tunnel was used by cars until the 1980s. Perhaps the most awe-inspiring section of the entire Roman road network was located on what is now the border of Serbia and Romania, where the Danube rushes through the rugged gorge called the Iron Gates. Just below the gates, Trajan built the greatest of all Roman bridges, a kilometer-long leviathan supported by 20 immense piers. Upstream, Trajan's engineers hacked a highway through the riverside cliffs, suspending part of the roadbed over the water on enormous beams. Roman roads were designed to carry the traffic of their day, riders, wagons, and, above all, marching soldiers, in any weather. They were meant to be both convenience and symbol, and served both purposes well. The sheer durability of the system, with its hundreds of still-functioning bridges, is incredible. But the Roman roads, like any roads, were very far from immortal. Milestones record numerous repairs and reconstructions of the major roads. The inscriptions sometimes mention damage caused by heavy rain or flash floods, but the most common causes given for repair are age and wear. The famous Via Appia was repaired many times over the centuries, and often improved with new bridges and viaducts. One inscription notes the resurfacing of a worn-out section of limestone paving with harder-wearing basalt. Despite the awesome longevity of their bridges, most Roman roads vanished during the Middle Ages. Yet in the early modern period, when European engineers began to build new highways, they consciously imitated the Roman roads, sometimes at the point of trying to reconstruct an ancient road network. The pioneering road-building methods of Scottish engineer John McAdam, likewise, were partly inspired by Roman techniques. Modern expressways, however, are very different beasts from Roman roads. First and foremost, they're designed to carry motor vehicles, which are not only heavier than horse-drawn carts, but also far faster and much more numerous. In terms of sheer stress, a busy section of American Highway probably takes more punishment in a single day than most Roman roads did in an entire year. Modern roads are engineered to handle those enormous stresses without being prohibitively expensive to build. In practice, that means a lot of reinforced concrete and asphalt. Though highly effective, and as highly cost-effective, these materials begin to break down fairly quickly under heavy traffic. In this sense, 
and in the sense that even most expressway bridges in America are designed to last only a half century or so, modern highways really are less durable than Roman roads. All this really means, of course, is that modern highways serve a very different purpose from their ancient counterparts. Roman highways weren't better engineered. They were just products of construction methods that were perfectly tailored to the traffic and terrain of the ancient Mediterranean. The fact that ancient and modern highways aren't directly comparable, however, does nothing to diminish the achievement of the roads that were one of the greatest products and most enduring legacies of the Roman peace. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Tolan Stone on Patreon. You might also enjoy my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.